There we go. Kid <laughs> Cootie, the Crookers, uh, day and night at nine minutes past eight right here on your best mix of music, 98.4 Capital FM. Ooh, we are so, so excited to welcome such a super, super serious. Well, you're not serious, but I was just like, oh, no. Oh, no. The ambassador of Ukraine to Kenya is coming in. This is very intense. But actually, he is just such a lovely I got a hug in I did get a hug in <laughs> let me please introduce his excellency Andrei Pravednik is that what did I just absolutely was that horrible was no no that was great you did it the right way <laughs> Andrei Habari Leo Andrei uh Habari? Oh, Habari Leo. Zuri Sana. Yes. yes. There you Zuri go. Sana. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Andre, uh, can I call you Andre? Sorry. Yes, You're not definitely. Gonna have no me problems. whacked. Um, so, how long have you been in Kenya as the ambassador? Uh, I have been working in Kenya for three years and three months. I really enjoy this beautiful country and uh, I'm honored and happy to serve my country in Nairobi. So, uh, completely, completely random. I mean, full full disclosure, I know very little about Ukraine, and um, I'm sorry for that, but that's why you're here to tell me, to educate all of us. Um, so, where is the Ukrainian embassy, and, and how many Ukrainians are in Kenya? Uh, the embassy of Ukraine is located in Mutaiga, mm-hmm. on Limuru Road. The address is 674 Limuru Road. Uh, we are there for more than uh, 15 years. Uh, we opened our embassy here in 2004, means it's even more than 15 years. Uh, in reality, it's 18 years will be this year. And um, there we are a small embassy. We ha- I have, okay, six other colleagues working with me. Uh, all of them are professionals and I'm proud to uh, uh, serve together with him for the interests of both Kenya and Ukraine. And I would, I would just ask. Apart, we know why you're here, and um, we are going to get into the current current affairs. But what are the, the top three things that the Ukrainian embassy is doing in Kenya? Apart from you know, not not mentioning what's what's currently happening to your country or in your country. Uh, before before the start of the Russian full scale Russian invasion to Ukraine, the main three areas of our focus uh, were uh, the trade and economic relations and in particular development uh, of our cooperation in agricultural sector uh, as well as machinery building and uh, secondly that the uh, development of our cultural uh, ties and in particular uh, the development of the educational exchanges Uh, we noticed for the last four years that the number of young Kenyans uh, willing to study in Ukraine uh, was grown steadily. Uh, and the third area I would call uh, the um, proper cultural exchanges because uh, a lot of we were planning, let's say, if uh, it would not happen, what happened, uh, we were planning to bring uh, belly. Ukrainian ballet to Kenya no. and uh, yes and um, some Ukrainian belly dancers uh, were willing uh, to help young Kenyans living in um, Kibera slum wow. to learn ballet dancing because some local Kenyans have a uh, school in Kibera yes. uh, <coughs> dancing school yep. and they've been asked us to help them to bring ballet dancers and show talented young Kenyans uh, how to dance ballet. Uh, unfortunately, mm, uh, okay, due to a variety of reasons, the first reason was COVID. Uh, and the second reason now that's a uh, Russian barbaric invasion to Ukraine. But uh, I'm convinced that as soon as we win, uh, we'll be able again to talk about these ballet dances come to Kenya to show Kenyans uh, how beautiful a belly dancing is mm. and uh, uh, <coughs> teach local talented children to uh, to to dance ballet and actually um honestly um from what i've seen for my three years being in kenya is that you have so many talented young kenyans willing to learn willing to study and i think that not only Ukraine, but uh, 
all the countries uh, uh, which have embassies here in Kenya should help these young, talented Kenyans uh, to reach the sky. Wow. Uh, now, now uh, Ukraine obviously known as well for welcoming a number of Africans for uh, studies. Uh, we've seen this, unfortunately, from the side of the war or the invasion. Uh, but but that's an incredible thing that the Ukraine does. I had no idea until this this uh, invasion began that the Ukraine actually welcomes a lot of African students into to study uh, and, and medicine as well, being one of the top uh, top uh, areas. Yes, you're, you're definitely right. We, before the invasion, we had... Uh, from Africa, we had more than 3,000 students mm. from different African countries. Uh, and uh, from Kenya, it were more than 300 students uh, in different places in Ukraine. And uh, I would like to mention about the one place which uh, was um, heavily discussed all around the world and in, in African countries too, that the place called City of Sumer. Uh, there is a wonderful, wonderf- wonderful university in Sumer. Uh, and a lot of African students uh, choose to study there. Uh, and there were 83 Kenyans studying at Sumi. And if you remember the developments, the uh, Russians uh, took the Sumi under siege and they heavily bombarded um, the city. And uh, the government of Ukraine uh, was doing whatever is possible to take all these foreign students, including Kenyans, out to the safety mm. uh, um, and the, 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 the challenge was that the Russian troops were not um, in a position to agree for humanitarian corridor or even if they uh, formally agreed to that they've broken that agreement okay let's say half an hour before the evacuation okay. uh, but then thanks God we managed to create that humanitarian corridor and all students were brought to safety initially to Poltava it's a city in Ukraine and then from Poltava to western border uh, of Ukraine and now all African students who were willing to leave Ukraine for safety uh, either in Poland, uh, Hun- Hungary, Slovakia, or Romania, but many of them already back home to their families. Sure, I've read that. Yeah, absolutely. Before we jump into what is uh, what is currently happening, uh, Andre or His Excellency Pravednik, please just paint the picture of Ukraine before all of this happened. What what does it feel like? What does it taste like? What does it look like to us? Uh, my country is very beautiful uh, and it has a thousand, even more than thousand years history. Uh, if to compare my country with Kenya, the territory of Ukraine is 30,000 uh, kilometers bigger than Kenya, it means they're comparable in size and they're also comparable in population. Uh, the population of Ukraine is 43 million people, the population of Kenya, if I'm not mistaken, 47 or so around that Correct. figure. Um, and uh, my country also has a different mm, climate zones. We have beautiful mountains called Carpathian Mountains. We have a, we have a seaside. Uh, it's a black sea. Uh, then we have beautiful fields. One of the uh, most uh, known pictures of Ukraine is a, is a, uh, is a picture when you see a blue sky and fields either a wheat which is has a gold okay gold color or the fields of sunflowers mm. and um, there is no exactly um, explanation one we have our national color in in blue and yellow but one of the okay stories so to say is that uh, it's the blue indicates the blue sky we have and the yellow indicates uh, fields of wheat Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, obviously, what's on the top of everyone's mind, uh, and they want to hear from from you as well, is uh, the invasion, what it's what it means, why did this happen, uh, and we're going to get into that when we come back in just a few minutes. Uh, so, you, if you have any questions, get them in now. You can tweet us nine eight four in the morning hashtag drive in or send us a WhatsApp on zero seven zero one nine eight four nine eight four. There we go, Mike Posner, cooler than me. 21 minutes past eight right here on your best mix of music, 98.4 Capital FM. We have His Excellency, the Ukrainian ambassador to Kenya, Andriy Pravednik, in studio with us this morning. 
Uh, if you have any questions, get them in Twitter or uh, WhatsApp. Or you can send us voice notes if you'd like. Um, you guys are discussing facts and figures and numbers, and I've got lost a little bit there. <laughs> but you asked a very important question: uh, the 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 religious structure of the Ukraine, uh, which would be predominantly uh, Christian Orthodox. Christian Orthodox. Okay. Okay. Good. Now, I, I think we'll, let's get into the, the reason that we're here. This is not something that uh, the Russian president woke up one morning and decided to do. This is this is a historical um, historical uh, plan. You uncomfortable situation, if I'm not mm. mistaken, right? Yes. Um, and and of course, Crimea played a big part in all of this as well, if I'm not mistaken. Why is and let's just break it down. Start from the ground zero. Why is this happening? Okay, I will try to make a long story short, which is challenging itself, since, okay, if the origins of what is going now goes back into the history, and all that started at the beginning of 18th century, when the then Russian Tsar Peter the Great uh, decided uh, to create a new state called Russia, uh, which before that used to be called for 300 years Moscovia, uh, and to, in order to do that, he had to rewrite the history of the state which had a name, Kievska Rus, and which was state of my people and my land. Uh, and then uh, Peter the Great and then Catherine the Great and other Russian uh, uh, emperors, they imposed a s- very strict uh, limitation on us for the use of our language, our culture, our literature. Mm. And to be honest with you, in mid 19th century, the Tsar, the Nikolai the I, Nikolai the I, introduced the, the complete ban on Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian culture, and Ukrainian language. Wow. Ba- but thanks uh, to ordinary Ukrainian people, mostly peasants living in the countryside, they've managed uh, to preserve the language, to preserve the culture. And uh, then, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, we've been independent for five years, from 1917 to 1922. But then we've been forced to join the Soviet Union by Bolsheviks regime, Bolsheviks regime from Moscow. Uh, and we stay in the Soviet Union until 1991. And I think that I, I, I have to, okay, although, okay, we don't like figures, but I have to give you one figure, which is important for understanding uh, for our, uh, uh, okay, how say, tr- not trust, but uh, our belief in freedom and to be independent. In 1991, in, on the 24th of, o- 24th of August 1991, our parliament called Verkhovna Rada uh, proclaimed independence of Ukraine. <laughs> but then uh, parliament decided that it's so important issue that uh, it should be brought to the national referendum. And we had our national referendum on the 1st of December 1991. And 94%, I would like to reiterate it, 94% of our population voted for independence. But And that's the main reason why we have the Russian full-scale invasion to Ukraine. Because Russian political elite could not accept the fact that Ukraine became independent because a lot of Russian politicians, including that, um, I'm sorry uh, uh, to call him, okay, not, I'm sorry to say that on the radio, but insane dwarf from Kremlin, uh, <laughs> he actually uh, <coughs> told that on many occasions that the greatness of Russia is not possible without Ukraine means he has that insane idea that Ukraine should be part of Russia, that we have the same language, we have the same culture, and we are uh, simply the same people, which is not the truth. I love that. First of all, I love that. And I love that you are speaking your mind because that is what we're all about on 98.4 Capital FM. But I I have to ask you, but but why is the insane dwarf so fixated, (laughs) as we'll now call him forever, with Ukraine and why is he not saying that to everyone around why just Ukraine are you guys rich are you just fancy are you cool why you can I just add and also add on to Davina's question I, I if if I'm and I could be wrong here there's a lot of uh, other air, uh, countries in the area post uh, Soviet Union that have kind of uh, sided with Russia 
I think for for Ukraine, if I'm not wrong, it, it was true independence. You were truly independent. You you were not Russian. If you look at someone like Belarus, for example, they are still quote unquote yeah, Russian. That's because he's his friend. No, no, but but he has a lot of friends in the area. Okay, so I'm not mistaken, right? So I'm correct. Oh, you are saying the correct thing. Thank thank you for 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 uh, bringing that question on the table. Uh, Ukraine and some other post-Soviet countries. Uh, okay, consists of okay, like over two main. Um, how to say that? Um, Gangs. Um, yes, uh, one is really independent state. Where, okay, which are Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia. Uh, we are not uh, taking to count Baltic states because they've been okay uh, uh, part of the Soviet Union only for for a little bit less than fifty years, and they've never been considered as part of Soviet Union by the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of us all considered them to be occupied by the uh, by the Soviet Union. Uh, okay, but if we take okay the rest of the Soviet republics, former Soviet republics, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, uh, okay, uh, 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 Azerbaijan, they're okay, really okay, independence in a sense of that word. Yes, all others also from the legal point of view are independent states. But as you rightly uh, mentioned, uh, Belarus, from the legal point of view, is an independent state. But in real life, anything Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, is doing, he's doing in a close consultation, so to say, with with that guy from Kremlin. Mm -hmm. uh, means they don't have a separate foreign policy, independent foreign policy. They don't have their ec economic separate economic policy, and they're under full control of the Russian Federation, like uh, some other mm, like some other countries, uh, to the lesser extent than Belarus. But also they're being under very uh okay not have a heavy influence from russian federation uh but uh to in a way to prove my uh st statement about the real independent states look what 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 happened for for these years uh after the dissolution of soviet union in 1991 moldova russian troops occupied part of moldova called from 1992 they have their uh, their army there from that time for 30 years and they're not allowing Moldova to enjoy the peace. Georgia, 2008. Uh, Russian troops invaded Georgia and occupied part of Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia uh, on the pretext of protecting people from Georgians. <laughs> and that pretext they, they used now. They initially they used, okay, a pretext that they're coming to Ukraine, as they call it, special military operation, which is nonsense. That's a full-scale invasion, unprovoked and unjustified. Uh, and pretext was that they're coming to Ukraine to denazify Ukraine, to demilitarize Ukraine, mm. and to protect Russian-speaking population. All three notions are false, mm -hmm. and I can easily prove it. Okay, and 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 you know the the whole conversation around NATO obviously is part of uh, the discussion as well, especially from the side of the Kremlin. They don't want NATO to have a presence in the Ukraine or Ukraine to be part of NATO. Is this also part of their reasoning? Yes, definitely, that was part of their reasoning. But uh, I will allow myself to uh, okay to mention the pretexts they used. Initial was um, as I mentioned was denazification, delimitarization and protection of Russian speaking population. Then the second one was that we are creating nuclear weapons. The third one was that we are creating biological weapons. But then finally around 12 days ago uh, that um, uh, insane war from Kremlin told again to Russian people that the real reason for our uh, uh, invasion to Ukraine, okay, he used sp for our special military operation, is that we are defending the future of Russia and we are defending future of Russian people, and that operation is preemptive one, since unless we start invasion, Ukrainians would attack us, which is complete nonsense. We never had any plans to invade mm. to any country 
All we want is let us live in peace and mm-hmm. build our Ukraine the way we want it. Yes, and, and a relatively new independent state as well. So there's lots of building to do in terms of systems and things of that nature, right? We're going to take a break. When we come back, uh, I would like to ask, and we will discuss, the resilience of the Ukrainian people. I don't think anyone anywhere in the world expected this kind of um, unity. Um, and resilience from the Ukrainian people. It's a wonderful thing to see. I mean, in, in amidst a very difficult situation, it's a wonderful thing to see. And also, my sister would like your president's phone number, if possible. <laughs> I will try to find it. Don't. Please don't. Don't. It's uh, 28 <laughs> minutes to nine. There we go. Deep Blue Something. Breakfast at Tiffany's at 18 minutes to nine. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. We have so much, uh, so many comments and responses on social media. We'll try to get to uh, all of those. But if not... We will ask the pertinent questions ourselves. And we are all always, always business here on 98.4 Capital FM. And if you are all business and you're wanting to build your business bigger, well, Safaricom is there for you. They are a leading technology service provider. I want you to head to www.business.safaricom.co.ke forward slash built for bigger. Check out all of the various technology solutions available from Safaricom and tell us on a voice note on 0701-984-984 how Safaricom is helping your business get bigger with all of their technology solutions. Do that and you could win 3K. That's right. Now, the Ukrainian ambassador to Kenya, Andre Pravetnik, Andri. Andri Pravetnik is in studio with us this morning. And we are <clears throat> talking quite a bit off air as well. But let's get back into our discussion this morning. Um, and, and, and I think the discussion revolves around uh, the, the, the unity of, of the Ukrainian uh, people. Now, the whole world, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of these, which is wonderful, you know, <gasps> stickers and flags and oh. at football matches, the players are wearing patches and things. But, but you know, if we're going to call a spade a spade, this is a, this is a, uh, a battle for Ukrainians to defend their land. And I don't think anyone in the entire world could have predicted the resistance and resilience and the unity of the Ukrainian people. Are you also surprised? Uh I think that I wouldn't I would I would not call that situation as a surprise but uh, I think that that terrible actions by Russian Federation that full scale invasion helped Ukrainian to stay even more united as before we've all been, been striving for our independence for our right to choose our own way to build our country to live uh the way we want we want it and now 99.99% if not the 100% of ukrainians are united as never before and believe me or not uh all ukrainians are fully prepared to defend our country to defend our land to defend our future and future our kids and i know from my friends in kiev that all people in our capital are stand together and in case if Russian troops will try to attack our capital again, all people of my home city Kyiv will be prepared to defend it until very last sigh of a uh, last soldier or last uh, uh, inhabitant of my capital. And that is that is uh, really touching uh, and um, I wish I, w- I would be there with my compatriots to defend my country, but I'm here and I'm trying to do with my colleagues here at the embassy whatever we can uh, to uh, people of Kenya, uh, to people um, in neighboring countries of East Africa, to know the truth, to know what we are fighting for, mm-hmm. and to know the terrible crimes Russian troops are committing in Ukraine Mm. even right now while we are talking. Now we are seeing a rise in in, in fuel prices, in food prices. What what would this continuation of this invasion mean for Kenyans? Uh, It would be not fair if I would say that it it will not be any negative implications for Kenya and many, many other countries all around the world as a result of that uh, Russian invasion uh, because we all know that Ukraine used to be called and now regained this title of being breadbasket 
uh, of uh, okay initially it was breadbasket of europe but now okay we are playing an important role to the world food security because uh, agriculture is one of the main sector of our economies economy and um, for you to understand uh, um, last year 2021 uh, the total crop of grain was 80 metric million tons which is uh, a record high in whole history of ukraine and uh, we can provide a f- food security to a large number of countries all around the world including africa including kenya because kenya imported a lot of ukrainian grain mm. uh, definitely there will be some negative implications since uh hostilities which are taking place not allow ukrainian agricultural workers uh to work as during the peaceful time but uh, i would like to assure kenyan public uh, and all kenyans that ukraine and my compatriots we are doing everything possible to start sown campaign on time and it's about to start in 10 to 12 days and we will be doing whatever we can uh, to get a good crop and not to allow people in other countries uh, to face these negative implications. But uh, I would like to underline that in the first place, not Ukraine should be blamed for this possible negative implication. It's Russia which should be blamed for that because it's Russia who started that full-scale invasion and which, okay, preclude Ukraine to make this own campaign at full uh, scale and to make sure that we have uh, the same crop at least as last year. But again, uh, sorry for repetition of what I have said, but it's important and I would like all those who listen to us uh, to hear that, that we will do whatever we can to make sure that we have a good crop and we'll uh, make sure that uh, this possible negative uh, implications will be brought to minimum. Is there a double standard by the rest of the world? So let's take Europe, maybe the United States, about this whole situation, you know, the sanctions, et cetera, et cetera, but then at the same time, you know, allowing still gas to come through. Is there a double standard being set by the rest of the world in any degree, would you say? Um, no, I wouldn't say that it's a double standard. Uh, first of all, we are really grateful to all our partner countries, United States, Canada, the whole of the European Union, uh, United Kingdom, for helping us uh, to fight the Russian, uh, okay, to withstand uh, Russian aggression and to fight for our freedom and independence. Uh, secondly, when we are talking about sanctions, if you uh, take a glimpse on the sanctions, uh, Initially, there was okay. The the amount of sanctions was relatively small. Then, with the start of invasion and with hostilities going on, as and, and with Russian troops uh, committing the crimes, uh, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, the international community uh, imposed stricter and stricter sanctions. And if we are talking about the gas and um, oil from Russia, United States already announced that they uh, com- uh, completely um, stop buying Russian oil and Russian gas. European Union is about to take a decision shortly. They will have a European Council uh, in an okay t- tomorrow, mm-hmm. where that issue will be definitely discussed. <coughs> and they are about also to approve. Uh, the uh, blockade of buying to buying uh, Russian oil and gas. Uh, UK already approved a similar decision uh, that they will stop buying Russian oil and gas uh, closer to the end of this year. Means all the countries uh, are prepared uh, to stop buying Russian oil and gas. And as we know oil and gas as the two main uh, export um, I okay items probably is not the right word uh, for for the Russian Federation and uh, and g- in a way getting the 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 the, the, the currency mm. for that and sustaining their troops in fighting Ukraine and mm. that is why that is why 
uh, we are also campaigning all around the world, including Kenya, for the governments to impose sanctions on the Russian Federation in thus not allowing Russia to finance the further uh, invasion to Ukraine. Okay. What is the mood like uh, on the ground in Ukraine? I'm sure you, you have loved ones still there. Is it, is it, it I mean... It seems like such a, a, a massive, massive thing to overcome. I mean, we don't know when is the end. or it, what, what are people feeling? People feeling, um, on the one hand, and we already discussed that, people feel in unity uh, and people feeling uh, readiness uh, to defend the country. On the other hand, people uh, suffer from that because they're losing their loved ones. Uh, and uh, with me, my family, okay, is safe, thanks God. But uh, I also can can share with you that my feelings, since my my dad, who is 80 years old, he is in Kiev now. And when I uh, talk, w- when I talk to him uh, after the start of the Russian full-scale invasion, that uh, dad, okay, I would like to evacuate you to a safe place. It will be better for you. He told me, no, son, I'm not going to work it anywhere. I spent all my life in this city uh, and um, uh, my wife is buried here and I'm not going anywhere because I would like to be with, with, with my uh, neighbors, uh, with the rest of the family, with, with all those uh, whom I, I, I love. And honestly, for me, it's a challenge since, okay, every morning uh, I'm sending messages to my dad asking how he is, whether he's fine or not. Thanks God he's fine. He he actually uh, haven't experienced, uh, okay, the, the area, his neighborhood never experienced any, any shell and a bombing. Uh, and so I pray personally and then uh, my kids his grandkids praying for his safety and security and I really hope that that we'll have an opportunity to hug each uh, one uh, in the near future. Well, thank you so much for for giving us that uh, because I feel like we get so desensitized to numbers and images of explosions and headlines and it's it's so lovely to put uh, my first Ukrainian uh, in interaction and have it here on 98.4 Capital FM. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, His Excellency Andri Pravednik. You have to, by the way, you have to teach us something. Oh yeah, you uh, teach, teach us. us. You 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 shared with me how to say love in Ukrainian. <gasps> how do you say love? Kohanya. Kohanya. Oh, there we go. Kohanya. We'll be using yes. that now. Yes. Yeah, Kohanya. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for coming in this morning. Uh, thank you. We didn't get to all your questions, but we will send them across to uh, the embassy, and maybe they can answer them for you. It's six minutes to nine.